Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the Editor-in-Chief of CFN. Hello, Brian. I hope you're doing well today. I'm well. It's good to see you. Hello, Katie from the Bronx. Good to see you. Our first person in looks at the live stream. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Yes, welcome, everyone. Got a great store, a great show for you today. I think we're going to be breaking some some significant news that you probably haven't heard elsewhere. So stay tuned. Uh, if you enjoy this show, if you're not a first time comer, please like the video, uh, share it on Facebook and Twitter to help us grow our live audience. We just recently started streaming live, and we'd love to have more guests with us as we do the show. So our stories this week are going to include, first of all, some very tragic news. The story you may have heard about the murder of a Catholic member of the British Parliament, Sir David Ames. And even, even worse, in, in one sense, the murder, he was actually denied access to the sacraments. A priest was trying to get to him, was wanting to get to him, and that priest was denied uh, to administer the sacraments before he passed. Mm. So let us all pray for the repose of the soul of Sir David Ames, and we'll share with you the details of that story. Uh, we're also going to cover Rome's approval just announced this week of an Episcopal conference specifically for the Amazon region, which was one of the quote unquote recommendations in the final document after the Amazon Synod. And it's also connected, as you'll see, with with probably some forthcoming liturgical innovation, uh, inculturation. So we'll get into all that. Uh, also, and this is the story you probably haven't heard before, two related events that took place last week, one focused on religion, the other on environmentalism, and their connection to synodality and even possibly a new council. Uh, there's mention of a Vatican III, and it's not coming from me, so you, you'll stick around for that one. You'll definitely want to hear that story. Um, we also have to report some very distasteful news, a homosexual music video that was filmed inside a Capuchin Franciscan church in Brazil. And the video, as you, we won't show footage of it, but we do have some still photos, uh, it's clearly intended to, to mock the faith and to promote unnatural vice. And then finally, time permitting, uh, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano has released a couple of new texts since our previous show. So if we can, we'll provide a few highlights from those uh, and encourage you to read them in full on our website. So before uh, we get into all of the news, as always, we'll take a brief look at the church's liturgical calendar and spend a few moments pondering the things that are above, the, as St. Paul says. We are coming to you today live uh, Thursday, October 21st, 2021, and it is the Feast of St. Hilarion on the traditional Roman calendar. He was a, a fourth century abbot. I'm just going to read the little uh, highlight in my hand missile here. It says, St. Hilarion, a native of Palestine, was instructed by the first lawgiver of the Anchorites, kind of a, a technical term for hermits, St. Anthony the Great, St. Anthony of the Desert, you might have, have heard him called. And St. Hilarion became one of the founders of the eremitical or hermit life in the Holy Land, as well as Syria and Egypt. And he died in the year of our Lord, 372. I think he's a good saint specifically for what's going on with the persecution of traditional religious, as we've reported on. So we ask St. Hilarion to intercede for specifically the Carmelite nuns in Pennsylvania and Nebraska and, and any other uh, nuns or brothers, priests, religious who are being persecuted for their fidelity to tradition and to the Holy Catholic faith. Uh, other saints celebrated since our last show in, include some major names. First of all, last Friday, we celebrated the feast of St. Teresa of Avila, speaking of the Carmelites. Her feast is on October 15th. Uh, then on Sunday, uh, October 17th, was the feast 
of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, the Apostle of the Sacred Heart of our Lord. Uh, Monday, October 18th, the Feast of St. Luke, the Evangelist. And for those who may have not seen the October edition of CFN, we have a wonderful article by one of our uh, good contributors, Mark Fellows, who's written an article about the life of St. Luke and, uh, and including about his relics. It's really interesting. So check that out if you haven't yet. And also this week we celebrated the feast of St. Peter of Alcantara, who was Franciscan priest and actually the spiritual director of St. Teresa of Avila, who really helped her uh, not only in her own personal spiritual life, but in the reform of the Carmelites. They were in desperate need of reform and a return to the true spirit of Carmel in her days. And then finally, yesterday, October 20th, was the feast of St. John Cantius. And Brian might know a little more. Isn't there an order that's named after him? Uh, that um, is... Yeah, I don't think it's an order. It's a group of priests in Chicago, um, yes. pr primarily, that have um, promoted interest in the traditional mass there. So I, I, I actually, I think they don't really... I was actually talking to a priest who was trying to join them. Um, the cardinal, even before soupage, denied them actually diocesan rights. They're sort of just a very private association of priests, but are living kind of a a, a particularized life under the patronage of St. John Cantius. But okay. um, particularly with Traditionis Custodes, I, I hope they are, are going to be able to survive. Yes, I guess time will tell. Yes. Uh, before we jump into our first story, giving the details about the, the murder of that Catholic British Catholic MP. We do have a couple of updates related to stories we reported on last week, specifically on the Synod on Synodality, aka the St. Gallen Synod. I've also called it the Sesame Street Synod, as well as Vatican III. And you may be wondering, what is this? We have no idea what this is. Well, you wouldn't be alone. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. You wouldn't so. be alone, because this is Cardinal Dolan, uh, yes. on October 17th, addressing the Synod, and here's what he has to say about what he thinks the Synod is all about. Now, you ask, just what is synodality, of which St. Fran Francis so often speaks? I don't know if I completely understand it every time. <laughs> Okay, let's let's just stop there. What is he saying? <laughs> the vicar of Christ doesn't know if he's on the path set by Christ. He can't figure it out. He doesn't and he doesn't know what he's doing. I don't know what I'm doing. But if we all maybe get together and none of us know what we're doing, we'll figure out what we're doing. And I just I love how <laughs> expressive the cardinal is when he speaks. He's like I don't know if I completely understand it everybody. Right, right. Which I guess is the reason he summoned us to this endeavor. Yeah. Like, it's just unbelievable. It's a, our Lord I, had a term for this. It's called the blind leading the blind, and they both fall into, fall the, into pit. the pit. Yes. I, I mean, this just sums up this whole nonsense. Exactly. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what path we're on. We don't know if it's really what God wants, but we're just we're going full steam ahead. Yes. Uh, now, on the flip side, there is a, some positive yes. to this story. <laughs> So it's also worth mentioning that Archbishop Wolfgang Haas of Vadus Lichtenstein, who happens to be a friend of the traditional mass and traditional orders, has announced that his archdiocese, which is very small, will not participate in the two-year synodal process. Quote, I am of the opinion, he says, that in our small archdiocese, it is possible for good reasons to refrain from carrying out such a complex and sometimes even complicated procedure. I think in his mind, he's probably thinking and convoluted, yes. <laughs> which in our parts runs the risk of becoming ideological. And really, that's true for the universal church. So 
So thanks be to God for Archbishop Haas and for his witness in refusing to participate in this nonsense. Yes, that's about the only sane response. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Okay, so after the little bit of humor, we enter into a more sober topic now with the, the very tragic death of a British member of, of Parliament. Uh, his gentleman's name, as I mentioned in the introduction, is Sir David uh, Ames. And I was going to read a little bit from the LifeSite report on this story, which I think the author Michael Haynes, if I know, remember correctly, is in England. So he had uh, probably very good access to information about what happened. So Mr. Haynes writes, a Catholic and pro-life conservative member of parliament has died today. This happened last week, Friday, October 15th, after being stabbed multiple times by an unidentified man who has since been identified. Sir David Ames, 69 years old, was stabbed while holding a meeting with constituents in Belfair's Methodist Church in Ley-on-Sea, Essex. A man reportedly walked into the church and stabbed the member of parliament for South End West shortly after 12.05 p.m. The alleged attacker has now been identified as Ali Harbi Ali, 25 years old, a British national of Somali origin. And my own comment, I think we can all mm -hmm. surmise his religion. Yes. Uh, Which the, the news media is ignoring completely. Right. Yes. So the, the report goes on, as police remained around the church and paramedics remained with a mess for over two hours. That's what makes this the next part of the story so egregious. Yes. This man is dying for two hours, two hours and is denied the sacraments. It's just disgusting. Um, so I guess we can move. So what does it say? Essex police announced at 2.39 p.m., that Sir David had died at the scene. So now we'll transition into the even more, in one sense, even more disturbing part of the story that police would actually deny a priest who was willing to administer the sacraments. Um, and the li again, the LifeSite report uh, shows that this priest wearing a, a traditional Roman chasuble, I don't know if he offers the traditional Latin mass, but it would appear so based on his vestments. So this priest is Father Jeffrey Woolno, uh, who uh, I don't know if he was the, the pastor of this member of parliament, but here's what the story says. Um, let's see here. So around 12.05, as I read on Friday, a mess was attacked by a 25 year old man and stabbed multiple times as he was holding a meeting with constituents. Uh, the alleged attacker, as I said, has been identified the Daily Mail later reported that as word of the stabbing spread, quote, a Roman Catholic priest, Father Jeffrey Wolno, arrived at the police cordon stretching across tree-lined Eastwood no uh, Road North, offering to administer the last rites to the devout devoutedly Catholic MP. LifeSite goes on, however, the Essex police didn't allow him to approach the dying MP arguing that they could not let him enter an active crime scene. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yes. And uh, the outrage of that was expressed by another member of parliament. Uh, and this is a, a quick little video from that floor of the House of uh, Commons, uh, where one of his colleagues comments on this. And then he goes on to, to speak about him uh, a little bit. Right. But again, this is a, that's quite historic to have in the House of the House of Commons, the very room that passed the Act of Supremacy, breaking with the church. I mean, in that very, you know, that uh, very house uh, of Henry VIII that brought the schism and heresy from Rome. You have right. now someone proclaiming you know, a very simple understanding, but a, but a very concise uh, explanation of the sacrament of extreme unction. And it was and, interesting that he called it extreme unction instead of the yes, anointing of the yes, sick. That's yes. interesting. Uh, no, it's interesting to see, and that he called, you know, we in Parliament should pass a law that this can't be done. And we know this was done 
previously not because of a crime scene, but because of the COVID uh, tyranny, that right. people were dying in hospitals. And that's why he mentions, I actually think that's why he mentions, whether it's in a care home, but in America we'd call it a nursing home, right. wherever it is, that people should never, a priest should never be denied access to give the last sacrament. So I right. think uh, hopefully... You know they will. The front benchers there will take up this and put it forward as a as a law uh, that the, this cannot be done. They cannot be denied. So I just wanted to read very briefly some of the testimony of the priest. LifeSite News was able to get in touch with the priest who gave his version of the events. Uh, as the local priest here in Leon C, uh, so he would just happen to be the local priest in the area. As soon as I found out about David, I went running up there to see how serious it was. I told one police officer, if he is dying, I need to anoint him. Uh, and what the response that he got is, I'm really sorry, Father, but they can't let you in. <laughs> uh, and the, the priest recalled seeing a helicopter and told LifeSite News, at that point I thought, if they're already airlifting him, I could say some prayers and try to find out where they're taking him. Uh, I, and he said, I thought if I can't go in, then Our Lady has, has to go in. Hmm. So again, we, let's remember him in our prayers and pray for the repose of his soul. And we hope that he had the desire to hmm. receive the sacraments and, and had the grace of making a good act of contrition. Yes, absolutely. Good sentiments, uh, particularly as we get close to the month of November, when we remember the holy souls. Yes. So, our second story, just when you thought it was safe, the Amazon Synod is back. <laughs> we, and this the is sort of one of the of things... Pachamama. The spirit of Pacamama. I actually I saw that ad volantis in the comments. Uh, most of the spirit of Pacamama lives on. Well, you're right. Yes. Uh, and this is sort of an interesting characteristic of the pa papacy of Pope Francis, that these sort of radical things are, are so quick in coming that you almost you sort of forget about them, right? We're sort of on to the next novelty, and you forget about the one before, and I think that's on purpose. That's a kind we're of so, technique. In other words, we're so used to being shocked and scandalized that it wears off too quickly. <laughs> yes, exactly. And we, you know, a lot of people thought, oh, that, that Amazon said that happened, that's over and done with, uh, That that's finished. Uh, but remember, it he, Francis himself, said, how, you know, there are a lot of things that need to happen now. And just with the, you know, the Synod on the family, not all of it happened right away. After a little time went by, people mm -hmm. cooled off, and we predicted this, then more radical things will actually be implemented. Uh, and, and to show, not the most, the most radical of uh, the proposals from that um, Synod, um, but uh, some... Uh, some proposals are starting to come forward. So just sort of the idea, I think, that people oh, forgot uh, about that uh, synod. Oh, I guess that's over. We've moved on to traditionis custodis or things. Uh, we got an interesting reminder uh, this week because the Vatican announced uh, that they were uh, going to implement one of the uh, proposals of uh, the uh, the synod. So we had a quick video which I was going to play, but it seems to not it seems to be acting up. I don't know why. Um, so I don't think I can uh, do it. It seems to. Sorry about that. It's not oh. letting me switch to that video for some reason. Um, but in any event, what the video uh, announced, and it had more scenes from Pacamama and the the, the praying at the Amazon synod that went on that uh, inculturated uh, the whole thing with uh, pagan. Uh, worship, but the video announced Pope Francis has implemented one of the proposals from the final document of the Amazon Synod. The proposal, which is in question, uh, number 115, uh, reads as follows. We propose the creation of a bishop's organism that promotes synodality among the churches of the region, helps to express the Amazonian face of this church and continues the task of finding new paths for the uh, evangelization. Right? Again, we got to keep finding new paths. Uh, why? Because maybe these post-Vatican II paths are not, not working. And again, this is another one of these phrases, sort of what does it mean? Um, like Cardinal Dolan, I don't know what it means. This was one of these phrases that came out of the Synod, uh, the Amazonian face of the church. Well, what does that mean? I mean, what, what about the face of the church is actually her head? The face of our Lord Jesus Christ is the face yes. of the church, not an Amazonian face. What about a, a divine face? Um, but 
uh, this we don't really know what that means. And really, what does this what has this done? So, what does this mean that he set up this Amazon uh, uh, bishops conference? Well, I think the way I understand this is the continued bureaucratization of the church. The church has become a kind of Max Weber bureaucratic institution institution and not the living body of Christ right it's interesting pope francis is always denouncing clericalism what he seems to be you know instituting is just sort of this bureaucratic expert uh, tyranny that, that rules the church uh, by having these these layers of complexity and bureaucracy. And as Cardinal, as not Cardinal, Bishop Haas from Lichtenstein said, this whole synodal thing is just so complicated. I, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. And right. that's really what another layer of this is, because there are already bishops' conferences in all of the countries that encompass the Amazonian region. Right. They already exist, right? And those are already have really grown into a novelty in and of themselves. And that's Bishops explicitly acknowledged in the final document of the um, Amazon Synod. It refers to Salam, which yes. is, is the Latin American Bishops Conference, and yes. also another organization called Repam, Repam. Mm -hmm. which is the Pan Amazonian Ecclesial Network. So it's not like bureaucracies don't already exist; they're just adding another one. Exactly, adding yet another one um, to to this mix, and it's interesting. I knew somebody that was a um, kind of a secretary or worked for a bishop in uh, an archbishop in a, in a diocese in the United States, mm -hmm. and I remember she said the the archbishop said to her once, you know, I, I just can't get anything done in the diocese. I can't do anything <laughs> because every day, and he showed her, you know, she saw it every day, another packet of bureaucratic oh, yeah. paperwork would come in from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, a survey, a questionnaire, guidelines to implement. And he just said, I, I spent all my time trying to keep up with all this. And he didn't use this phrase, I think bureaucratic paperwork, but it was just overwhelmed so that he couldn't actually be the bishop, right? Actually be right. a bishop. And I think this is just more of the same. I and mean, why do we need now an Amazonian bishops conference when there already are bishop conferences in individual com countries and already a Latin American and a Pan-Amazonian ecclesial network, whatever that is. Right. Um, I think it's the lay version of the bishops yes, conference. <laughs> exactly. The other novel point of this is it says uh, in the report from the Vatican that this bishops, con or this uh, Episcopal Conference uh, will not just be for bishops. So Episcopal Conferences are not just for bishops. It will include lay people <laughs> in, its, uh, in its organization. So again, another part of the German synodal path, this leveling of the, the hierarchy. Um, now, a reminder, where might this be going? What might this be created to do? Another recommendation from the synodal document, number 116, the Second Vatican Council created possibilities for liturgical pluralism. <laughs> the, for legitimate, whatever that means in these contexts, variations right. and adaptations for different groups, regions, and peoples. Right. Sacrosanctum Concilium number 38. In this sense, the liturgy should respond to culture so that it may be the source and summit of Christian life and be really linked to the people's sufferings and joys. We should give an authentically Catholic response to the request of the Amazonian communities to adapt the liturgy by valuing the original worldview, traditions, symbols, and rites that include transcendent community and Bacamama. ecological, <laughs> ecological <Bacamama>. dimensions. <laughs> no, I, no, it should not include the original worldview, and that original worldview included paganism. Right? Right. That should be rejected. And then the new organism of the church in the Amazon, this new bishops' conference that just was given birth, should establish a competent commission to study and discuss according to the habits and customs of the ancestral peoples the elaboration of an Amazonian rite that expresses the liturgical, theological, disciplinary, and spiritual patrimony of the Amazon. So, so there it is. Words, this is their test. A, a Pachamama Mass, basically. Yes, that's, I mean, just, yes, to put it short, a Pachamama Mass. And there's so many buzzwords here you have to watch out for. Like my law students, I tell them all the time, uh, if you see the head, the title of a law in Congress, usually that means the law does the opposite of what the title is. <laughs> so there's like the, the I, tell, I was teaching them the 2005 Bankruptcy Reform and Consumer Protection protection law, uh, which did nothing to protect consumers. It should have been called the bankruptcy reform and credit card protection law, because all it did was protect credit card companies so they could rip people off. Oh, so yeah. that, that's kind of the way, you know, 
it works. Uh, same kind of thing. Whenever you hear authentically, the authentic in, in these Vatican to speak, it usually means just code for novel, ridiculous, uh, and you know, adapted and just sort of if not heretical and if not heretical and blasphemous, <laughs> exactly. So yet another layer of bureaucracy from the Vatican is uh, is uh, up here, and it really just seems to be. Um, uh, just going to move forward with a, a new right uh, for well, the Amazon. And as we discussed when the Amazon Synod was going on in October 2019, you know, all, the groundwork for all of this was set in Sacro Sanctum Concilium. Uh, Brian read a quote. Yes. It's quoted in the final document, uh, Sacro Sanctum Concilium number 38. Well, two paragraphs later, Sacro Sanctum Concilium number 40 talks about even more radical adaptation of the liturgy in mission territories. Yes. So there you have it. Yes, there you have it. All right. So I think we'll head into our next story, and I'm excited to share this with you. I, It was I, kind of by happenstance that I stumbled upon this. Maybe it was God's providence at work, but I think it's a pretty significant revelation that we're going to make in this next story. But I have to I have to build up to it. I have to give you some background in order to make it um, uh, the full uh, significance of it evident. So this story is really summed up by saying interreligious dialogue and environmentalism prelude to Vatican three question mark. So we need to spend a few moments recalling the synod on synodality and specifically the following passages from the preparatory document that we've gone over in a previous show. So this is paragraph four from the preparatory document. It says, quote, the synodal journey unfolds within a historical context, meaning our times, marked by epochal changes in society and by a crucial transition in the life of the church, which cannot be ignored. But nowhere in the document is this crucial transition defined. I think it has to do with globalism, with the Great Reset, all of that. Uh, the next paragraph said, well, I want to finish this one, number four. It says, it is within the folds of the complexity of this context, which is not clearly defined, in its tensions and contradictions, that we are called to, and then it quotes from the Vatican II document, Gaudium et Spes, which is the constitution on the church in the modern world, quote, to scrutinize the signs of the times and interpret them in light in the light of the gospel. So paragraph five of this preparatory document for the synod says, a global tragedy such as the, the COVID-19 pandemic and then it quotes from Fratelli Tutti, momentarily revived the sense that we are a global community all in the same boat where one person's problems are the problems of all. Once more, we realize that no one is saved alone. We can only be saved together. And I think he's talking about in a temporal sense, not in the spiritual sense. But well, it's a pretty ambiguous phrase that could be, you know, interpreted in a heretical sense. I mean, well, that's it's a very, true, yes. Yeah. But this uh, text goes on, the, the preparatory document says, and this is the crucial, uh, the encyclicals Laudato Si, which is all about environmentalism, and Fratelli Tutti, which is all about human fraternity, which is really interreligious dialogue, religious indifferentism, uh, those two texts document the depth of the fault lines that run through humanity, and we can refer to these analyses to start listening to the cry of the poor and of the earth. So I take that to mean that Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti are integral to this synod on synodality, which means that environmentalism is integral to it, as well as interreligious dialogue and religious mm. indifferentism. Mm. So very important to understand that. So, moving on, as I said in the introduction, two events took place last week, one focused on religion, the other on environmentalism, uh, which I have discovered are very much interrelated and also connected to the Synod. So event number one, is called the Parliament of the World's Religions, which took place, yeah. <laughs> not not Parliament the Funk Band. <laughs> no. 
uh, Parliament of the World's Religions. The first one of these, some viewers may know, was held back in 1893 in Chicago. We mentioned Chicago earlier in the show with the Society of St. John Cantius. Chicago has long been a hotbed for major problems in both church and state. That was the the home territory, was it not, of uh, Saul Alinsky and all the community yes. organizing, yes. all of yes. that Marxism. Yes. It was also the home territory of such uh, unseemly church figures as Cardinal Joseph Bernadine, who was if you know at least as bad as cardinal mccarrick if not worse not worse our friend and colleague randy engel the author of the huge book the right of sodomy uh, documents his disgusting history in in great detail mm. if, if you have the stomach to read it it's pretty disgusting <laughs> and the popes condemned any Catholics attending these, so really culminating in the most definitive condemnation of Pius XI, that these parliaments right. of churches, the word that Catholics could have nothing to do with it. Right. So 1893 was the first one. I don't know. I would, I would highly doubt that any Catholics participated at that time. If they would have, they would have been severely disciplined. Fast forward 100 years to the next one, 1993, and guess who was in charge of, of uh, drafting this document that, they, that the leaders signed, including Cardinal Bernadine, none other than the ex, you know, I don't know if he was excommunicated, but under an interdict, uh, Father Hans Kuhn, one of the, the leading progressive lights at Vatican II, mm -hmm. helped draft, the, draft this globalist, um, you know, basically one world government document saying towards a global ethic global yeah towards a global ethic an initial yes. declaration of the parliament of the world's religions which ironically I, I read through this yesterday and it's really just reiterating the ten commandments without giving credit to god and our lord jesus right. christ it's just so hypocritical claiming that all the religions of the world teach these things when they really don't uh, it is god you know the one true god who gave us the natural and the divine law, they just refuse to acknowledge that. All right. So this event took place, uh, the most recent one, it was the 21st uh, meeting of this parliament, October 16th through 18th. And some of the two of the featured speakers among many were Dr. Jane Goodall, who is the famous naturalist. I think she went back in the mm -hmm. 60s and 70s. She went to live with the, the, the chimpanzees, chimpanzees somewhere yeah. and basically came to believe that they're persons no different than we are with, with the mm -hmm. same rights, et cetera, et cetera. And certainly not a uh, devout Orthodox Christian by any stretch. She's basically a, like a pantheist kind of God is just the great unknown that we could never possibly know and denies the possibility of divine revelation, all that kind of stuff. So she was a featured speaker at this event, as was Cardinal Peter Turkson, who, as viewers may recall, is Pope Francis's point man for all things globalist. He goes to the Davos meetings with the World Economic Forum. He's basically the church's representative to the global elites. And interestingly, I found on October 18th, uh, Monday of this week, the final day of the event, Vatican News just happened to publish an article and a video promoting the Pontifical Council for Inter Interreligious Dialogue. So you can draw your own conclusions what, if that was a coincidence or not. Uh, so that's the first event, dealing with religion, or rather the, the perversion of it. <laughs> mm, yes. uh, the second event was called the UN United Nations Biodiversity Conference and it was held in China. <laughs> 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 the country probably most responsible for polluting the planet. Yes. Um, interestingly, it's broken up. This event is broken up into phases very similar to the Synod. So phase one took place October 11th through the 15th. And phase two is scheduled for April 25th through May 8th of next year, which actually corresponds to phase two of the Synod. So again, <laughs> is this a coincidence? coincidence? I don't know, <laughs> but it's certainly very suspicious. So here's where we get into the really, um, really explosive revelation that I, that I came across. So on April 20th, 
just before the new synod program was announced because be prior to to may uh the synod on synodality looked different it was just supposed to be you know a quote unquote regular synod in rome in right October. if they if they're not bad enough regular right. synod. but if it was just going to be the old regular bad synod <laughs> exactly but then it morphed into this two-year synodal journey synodal process so on april 20th just before that new program was announced Dr. Goodall and Cardinal Turkson helped promote this UN Biodiversity Conference by participating in a webinar hosted by the Laudato Si Movement, which is an organization <laughs> co-founded by a, an Australian Catholic woman named Jackie Raymond. Towards the end of the webinar, there was a Q&A session during which Ms. Raymond asked Cardinal Turkson this question, and you have to hear it for yourself. If we can play that video. Cardinal Turkson, a, a question for you regarding um, perhaps an aspiration. Your question. Will Pope Francis and the Vatican consider calling for a global ecumenical council, a Vatican III, to plan implementation efforts in response to the call of Laudato Si to reverse and stop climate change and protect biodiversity? So if we can pause it there for just a second. I know the sound is a little bit low on the video, at least in my earbuds, so I want to make sure everybody heard. She's asking Cardinal Turkson if Pope Francis and the Vatican would consider calling a global ecumenical council, not just a synod. She literally uses the phrase, a Vatican III, uh, to plan implementation efforts in response to the call of Laudato Si to reverse and stop climate change and protect biodiversity. So let's listen to how the Cardinal responds. So again, call a council for climate change. <laughs> I, I, all right, yeah. here's his response. But, uh, but knowing Pope Francis and his response to country response to everything that is happening around us, I will not put this beyond him. But I, at the same time, I cannot. Put I would not put this beyond him. I know, I know. I mean, from the, his interest in organizing the Amazon Synod. Was not so if you want to pause there for just a second, mm -hmm. let me read again what he said. So when he when the lady said to him. I know it's speculative, but I think it's a very inspiring question to ask. The Cardinal said, yes, it is. It certainly is. But difficult for me to say yes or no or answer right away. But knowing Pope Francis, he says, and his concrete response to everything that is happening around us, I would not put this beyond him. Cardinal Turkson is saying he would not put it beyond Pope Francis to convene an ecumenical council of the church in relation to Laudato Si. Let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> but he goes on to say, I know I mean from his interest in organizing the Amazon Synod. Wow. So connecting this possible Vatican III to the Amazon Synod. Now, I want to stress something else before we finish this story. Uh, well, he also goes on to say, this can be suggested, this idea of a council can be suggested to the Holy Father at the next session that our dicastery, meaning the dicastery for promoting integral human development, may have with him for his consideration and thought. So he's basically saying, I'll pitch this to the Holy Father. Mm-hmm. So again, just to remind you of the chron chronology of how this happened, this webinar was live streamed on April 20th of this year. And according to the Vatican press release in late May, quote, Pope Francis on the 24th of April, four days after this webinar, approved a new synod synodal program for the 16th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, end quote. Again, coincidence? I don't know. But I, I think it is, for people who are dismissing the, the notion that this Synod on Synodality is a form of Vatican III, 
I think this provides some very compelling evidence to the contrary that it is that. Because it would make sense. I mean, this Pope likes to do things through manipulation and, and control, and you have a much easier way. I mean, they manipulated Vatican II, but it was harder. Yes. In, when you have the rules of an ecumenical council and you have all the bishops there, yes. you can't pick and choose who comes like he exactly. gets to do. It's much harder. So, I mean, I could see the suggestion being made. He says, well, why actually call a council? We can do more through this more manipulable, more malleable... Remember, this whole synodal thing doesn't exist really in the church. It's a novelty of Vatican II, so it has no history, has no guardrails around it. It's much easier to manipulate, and it seems like maybe the suggestion was made, he said, oh, I got a way to do it. We'll just turn this synodal synod, you know, journey into... We'll, we'll adapt it and essentially right. achieve these same well, aims. Well, they're, ma they're making it as long as an ecumenical council would take uh, this two uh, years. <laughs> and that's what's interesting about it, because that's what happens. An ecumenical council meets, and the it comes back unlike a synod which you know is not is sort of Usually this meeting and it's long. over yes so this is like i mean it's almost like an ecumenical council that goes on for several years mm -hmm. so it's again like everything modernist and new new religion it it's sort of the old forms but everything's radically different so it gives the appearance of being something when it's actually something else and that you know clearly what see i think seems to be going on here um, because they would be more hamstrung by by a, an actual council if they had to to deal with that and just to drive home this point before we move on i want to return very quickly to draw to reiterate that the synod is about um interreligious dialogue and environmentalism those are mm -hmm. those themes those are things. at the heart of this monstrosity yes and that's made very clear if you remember in the preparatory document towards the end there are what is called 10 thematic nuclei yes for those of you who remember from middle school, high school biology, the nucleus is the part of the cell where the genetic information is kept and, it's, and is replicated. So these 10 nuclei are basically the DNA of the synod. And part of that DNA uh, says things as follows. Let me see. How do we promote the active participation of all the faithful in the liturgy and the exercise of the sanctifying function uh, what experience, what experiences of dialogue and shared commitment do we have yeah. with believers of other religions and with non-believers? Also, um, let's see here. It says, what tools help us to read the dynamics of the culture in which we are immersed and their impact on our style of church? But most of all, I want to go back to what it says in uh, paragraph, what is it, four or five? of the document where it says the encyclicals Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti document the depth of the fault lines that run through humanity and we can refer to these analyses to start listening to the cry of the poor and of the earth. So if you want to understand what's going on with this synod, it's Laudato Si, environmentalism, it's Fratelli Tutti, religious indifferentism and so-called basically free Masonic human fraternity. Yes. So, again, really, this all that's been out, I hadn't seen anyone report on this little exchange before with Turkson, uh, where he, he talked about this with Vatican I'll try III. to put all of this in article form so we can circulate it on our website. Yes. So we move on to a very sad story. Um, it October 9th, a music, if you can call it that, video uh, <laughs> was released. Uh, this video was filmed in St. Sebastian's Church in Moros, Brazil. Uh, so a traditionally Catholic country and a Catholic church dedicated to the, the martyr St. Sebastian. And uh, it turns out this video is by a uh, produced by a openly homosexual music group. Um, and a little warning, I'm going to show you some pictures. They are really shocking. Uh, we're not, not going to play the video because it's worse. Yeah, uh, and much we, worse. We just, yeah, much, much worse. Um, but this is from Gloria TV, um, their report where they had some pictures. And the video is called Gloria. Gloria, rather than, it's a, again, a sort of distortion of the word Gloria. Right, because uh, they're all decked out in these sequins in these and jewels yes. and very effeminate very effeminate and kind of mock religious so that's yeah. that's the singer i'll just scroll down here are some of the um pictures 
you can see again that these sort of pseudo religious um, garb. Right. Uh, and all of this hullabaloo is taking place in the church. In the church, you see the altar right there, the IHS on it. Um, you know, here they are. Here's this person. Uh, here's the group standing in the san you know in the uh, nave of the church with the san the uh, sanctuary there. Um, you see again these images of prayer, the sort of mocking of prayer. Because uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what happens in the video, some of the words. Uh, the one singer speaks to a homosexual partner and says, "Get on top of me." In, in the sanctuary and then after he says that he goes into sort of an ecstasy that sort of communicates in the music that he sort of reached heaven right that he's in heaven now so in the clear message of the uh, video is that this sort of intrinsically evil act is a way to get to heaven right it's it's putting it in the sanctuary they make irreverently signs of the cross mimic prayers uh, throughout it and again interlaced with their sexualized language lyrics and actions relating to sodomy um, it, it's essentially um, an, a celebration of the act of sodomy right within the very sanctuary uh, of a church and this is sort of how far we've fallen uh, then the the leader of this group thanks the Capuchin father who's in charge of the church for letting him have the sanctuary. So it's not like they broke into the church or snuck in when nobody was watching. They were given permission by the Capuchin father who's in charge of it to use the sanctuary to produce this yes. filth. And tradition uh, in action, uh, some people would know it by the abbreviation TIA, reports the name of this priest as Fray Paolo Xavier the Capuchin in charge of St. Sebastian Church in Manaus. Yes, Manaus, uh, Brazil. Um, and again, this is how far we've come. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, this happens all the time. Sanctuaries are, are defiled uh, by letting non-Catholic groups come in and perform their false worship. I mean, that's multiple times where Catholic churches have been kind of rented out Um uh, to these other groups. And really, but this, for all we know, the, the Blessed Sacrament might have been in the tabernacle when they were doing all of this. We don't know. Yes, I mean, it's it's. there's no way to really tell if it if it is actually there. Um, um, it could be, but even if, if the Blessed Sacrament had been removed, and again, it was interesting, I remember the Assisi meeting in 1986 when a Buddha was put on the... Um, the tabernacle in one right. of the churches where the Buddhists were allowed to have their uh, their uh, thing, do their thing, and people were justifying it. The defenders of John Paul II. Oh well, they removed the Blessed Sacrament. Right. Oh well, that makes it all just okay. <laughs> right on a Catholic altar on top of the um, uh, tabernacle where the Blessed Sacrament was and would go back. Uh, but that that's okay. I mean, this is just so. Even if it were removed, that doesn't right, change. Right. This 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 sanctuary needs to be uh, exercised and reconsecrated. I mean, this is Absolutely. a desecration of the sacrist sanctuary uh, by allowing this group to be in there. Now, there were some unconfirmed reports. I read that the bishop of the the diocese here, kind of again, it was the hand wringing. I had no idea. I didn't realize. Hamada, hamada. I didn't realize. And right. you know, and he. Again, I haven't seen a direct statement from the bishop, but there were reports that the bishop may have said, oh, we, you know, I, I need to make reparation for this. So I hope that's true. Um, but, you know, frankly, what's going on with your priests? If you have a priest, this priest should be, I mean, you, you know, they're suspending priests out of Venus for saying uh, an ad orienta mass, or they're attempting to. This priest should be immediately suspended. Yes. Right? A priest who does this, who permits this, this is just really, I mean, an outrageous sacrilege. And uh, I just... Uh, this is what happened when the window opened by John the Twenty Third. This is what it's letting into the church, literally. Absolutely. And as Archbishop Bugino says, which we'll get into his writings in a moment, he describes, uh, forget exactly how he phrases it, but heresy, sodomy, and corruption are the trademarks of the deep church. They're like a trifecta yes. of evil that you always find together. Yes. And as he said, doctrinal 
uh, distortion will be met with moral distortion. That there is a connection between this violation of the natural and divine law on the moral level and doctrinal corruption. They go hand in hand. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, speaking of Archbishop Vigo, he's been very busy uh, lately. Uh, we had two things that we reported this week, which you can see uh, on the Catholic Family News website. We're grateful that His Grace uh, always sends us his, his various interventions. Uh, so that we can help distribute them along with Seems other Seems like there's outlets. a lot of resistance going on in, in Italy, in his home country. Yes, there's definitely a lot of resistance uh, going on. Uh, so he issued a, a video, which is in uh, Italian, um, but um, he issued a, a, a video in... To make in sure it. that it's not Vigano 2 or 3 or 4. Yes, right? exactly, <laughs> him, him speaking. Um, and But he did give us an English, there's not an English um, video, but an English uh, uh, sub uh, text, uh, yes. transcript. And uh, it is a call for the prayer of the Holy Rosary to end the pandemic, quote, emergency. And this is really in support of those in Italy who are trying to fight and resist the Covidian tyranny that uh, has been, been tyrannizing Italy. Yes. Uh, and he, he takes this to comment on the, the 450th uh, uh, anniversary of the Battle of uh, Lepanto, which we have mentioned previously that happened this month in 1571, uh, and by Don Juan of Austria, and talked about how the rosary uh, was so important. We know that Pope Pius V commanded prayers of the rosary in advance of it. The soldiers and the naval uh, uh, officers had uh, rosaries tied to their, to their arms, around mm -hmm. their arms, as they went into battle. And Pius V himself credited um, this great victory to the the holy uh, holy rosary being being prayed uh, and it really was a great religious victory and he says today our enemy is more subtle and treacherous than yes. those who than uh, those who ought to be our allies those who ought to help and protect us in the face of a threat that is no less fearful than the one faced then it is precisely they who are waging a merciless war against us. So he offers some really interesting contrast between yes. the situation in 1571, where yes. Christendom was facing an external enemy, and, and yes. the forces of Christendom came together to oppose that enemy, but now today the enemy is within. Yes, and he says, this is why the crisis we are going through is so serious. It stems from a crisis of authority, from a lack of moral principles and values that animate and orient those who command, even before those who obey. Those who command us are not fulfilling their role in favor of the Italian people, but instead are following the orders of a very powerful financial elite. And by those who I he refer to, he's obviously referring to the Italian government when he right. says the Italian people. I think he's also referring to the Italian episcopacy. I think he refer, he means both of them. They are both right. doing this. Those who are really in charge today are not themselves part of the institutions, but they make use of them by bribing their officials, blackmailing those they have placed there in order to manipulate them at will, ousting the honest and controlling the opposition. And this is really what's meant by the terms deep state and deep church, uh, right. really is what he's describing there. Exactly right. And so his uh, so that's his message on, uh, or his exhortation really to be devoted to praying the Holy Rosary every day, especially during the month of October, the month of the Rosary, but really all year long. And then his other message was a, uh, a video message for those who participated in something called a No Fear Day in the city of Turin. Mm -hmm. um, and he says at the beginning, so he's addressed, it's a pre-recorded message that was played to a crowd that was gathered. He says, you have gathered in such great numbers in this piazza in Turin. Remember, that's where the shroud, the holy shroud is kept of our Lord. As hundreds of thousands of people all around the world manifest their opposition to the establishment of a global tyranny. For months now, despite the deafening silence of the media, millions of citizens from every nation have cried out their NO in, ca in all caps, N-O. No to the pandemic folly, no to the lockdowns, to the curfews, to the imposition of vaccines, to the health passports, to the blackmails of the totalitarian power enslaved to the elite. This makes me think of Monica Smith, 
the courageous uh, woman in Australia that Brian interviewed recently. If you haven't watched that interview yet, mm-hmm. you definitely should because it's very inspiring to hear her give her testimony. <clears throat> Yes, and then he goes on at one point to say, quote, We respect all churches and religious traditions, they specify, and it is indeed true that all of the idols and superstitions find a place in the ecumenical pantheon of the new universal religion desired by Freemasonry and the Bergolian Church. But there is only one religion that is banned, the true religion, that our Lord, Je- our Lord taught to the apostles, the religion that the church proposes to us to believe. And again, look at the connections of all these stories today. He's hit the nail on the head here, right? The Pantheon in Rome was the, the, the shrine where the Romans would take all the different gods. So they would go and conquer people. Oh, you have your own god. Oh, we'll put him in the Pantheon. Oh, we'll put him in the Pantheon. Um, it was the place where they, it was the, really the height of ecumenism, because at their religion, they right. were happy to have as many gods as possible, and they would just take them in. And that's the, what the pantheon was in, in Rome. It was syncretism, basically. Syncretism. Just combining all the different religions together. And he's saying that's what this one world religion that we talked about in our previous story with, with Cardinal Turkson, what they want, which is to fill the role of Freemasonry and the Bergolian Church, right? Um, the, all these idols and superstitions. And what is the one thing, thing banned? A priest giving last rites to a dying man, right? The one true religion is the only thing. This reminds me, uh, really, of the essay on toleration by John Locke, who some consider <laughs> conservative. John Locke says, oh, yes, there should be freedom and toleration for all religions, except for the fanatics, not the Catholics. So there's toleration for everyone except the Catholics, according to uh, John Locke in his essay on toleration. Uh, this is exactly what uh, Archbishop Vigano is, is hitting on here. Uh, now, I saw some reports from the media, uh, the uh, sort of alternate media, that when he delivered this, when this video was played to the people who were protesting the COVID tyranny, that at it ended, the crowd chanted, Viga no, Viga no, Viga no, <laughs> that they were chanting his name over and over yes. again. And this is what I've commented many times. Many say, well, what's he doing? What's his role? This is where I think I see his, he sees his role, that he is being the bishop that they don't have. The, he is filling the gap by the bishops who should be. So the bishop of Torin should have spoken to these people and encouraged them as a bishop in the 19th century would have done for their standing up for the truth. He's absent. He's fled the scene. He's fled the foot of the cross. But Vigano is St. John not standing. An accomplice of the globalists. <laughs> yes. But Vigano is St. John standing at the foot of the cross saying, I will stay and I will give you the succor, the support, the encouragement that your bishop should be giving you through pastoral letters and through these addresses. And I think that's really uh, point here. So they're, be- they're just beautiful, powerful texts, and they're both on our website, so I recommend them uh, to you. Yes. Well, thank you. We broke a lot of ground, a lot of stories to cover this week, and a lot of updates as we'll continue to update on the Synod most likely every week or so. Um, but if you've enjoyed, as always, our free content, please consider helping us by spreading the word. Subscribe to our Rumble and YouTube channel so you never miss a free video. Watch for our live broadcasts. It's great having uh, uh, everyone here. It's been great watching uh, your back and forth. Uh, yeah, PF is a, is a communist, maybe a Marxist, or at least he's taken a playbook page out of their playbook at a minimum I agree I saw some of those comments going around Um, uh, so thank you for participating in the uh, the live uh, live session thank you for watching it please share it share the video subscribe to our channels and as always please consider a subscription to Catholic Family News we're just finishing up sending to press the November paper has some really great articles some new articles uh, that were some new people were publishing continuing on our Catholic race series uh, Catholic race theory series there's another installment of that we got back to something John Venari was doing a couple of years ago republishing some great articles by the solid theologian uh, Monsignor Clifford Fenton the editor of the, the-, the ecclesiastical American ecclesiastical review in and around the time of the council to give us some good guidance there uh, so uh, really it's a, a, a packed issue with a lot of great, great material. So please consider subscribing today and get the November issue uh, so that you can read all of the the, uh, content that's there that really develop many of the stories you hear in our podcasts and videos. Absolutely. 
All right. Well, as always, we will close our program by invoking Our Lady and entrusting ourselves and our families, friends, all of our endeavors to Jesus through Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the instruments of his holy passion, that thou may put division in the camp of thy enemies, for as thy beloved Son have said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. St. Hilarion. Pray for us. Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for us. Our Lady of the Rosary. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, again, thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you. Hello, Savannah Smiles. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you again, same time, God willing, uh, next week. Yes. Remember to like and share. And until next week, God bless and Godspeed. <laughs>